Thank you everyone for coming uh, to select the ideal LLM. This is gonna be a really practical talk. So, um, my name is Charles Watkins and I'm a lead developer advocate here at Salesforce. I'm really excited to talk about this talk because increasingly when you use AI tools, you are gonna be given the option to pick a large language model. And the difference between picking the right model and the wrong model has serious implications for user experience, for cost, for efficiency and accuracy. So in this talk, I'm gonna give you a few different ways to look at a model and understand whether or not it fits your use case. Now, as always, I wanna remind you all that Salesforce is a publicly traded company, and as such, you should make your purchasing decisions based on products and services that are generally available. Second, I wanna thank you all for being here, and I wanna say a thank you, special thank you to everyone watching on Salesforce Plus. So, our agenda is action-packed. First, I'm gonna give you three factors to look for when you are assessing a large language model. Then I'm gonna introduce you to the Salesforce LLM benchmark, the first of its kind benchmark for judging models for CRM use cases. I'm gonna do a quick demo, and then I'm gonna leave you with four steps for selecting the ideal model. So just to level set, just in case you know you, uh, you missed the whole large language model craze, um, large language models are a form of generative AI. They're trained on massive data sets, and as such, they are able to understand and generate human-sounding language. Now, LLMs are everywhere. They power chatbots. They power tools to help people with coding. They do lots of different things. But in the context of CRM, they have a variety of different use cases because CRM is all about interacting with humans. So with a large language model, you can draft personalized emails to customers in seconds. You can analyze user sentiment at scale. You can generate product descriptions just using technical specifications, and you can summarize lengthy call transcripts for key takeaways and action items. These are all really powerful tools that people aren't just talking about but are actually doing right now with large language models. So I promise to give you just three factors, and I'm gonna keep it simple. Three factors. These are the three things you need to know about a large language model to really understand how and when you should use it. The first is speed. That's just how quickly does the model think? The second is memory. How much information can it keep in its head? And then the third factor, and this is new, is modality, which is what types of inputs can the model handle and assess and process? So let's start off with the very first factor. And this is the most important one. And when most people think about large language models, they never consider it. Speed. Speed, or if you are really into the industry, inference speed is just how quickly a model can process an input and generate a response. Now, one thing to know about speed is that there's usually a trade-off between a model's intelligence and its speed. Really slow models, comparatively, tend to be very, very smart. And the models that are faster tend to be less intelligent. But the upside is that they're a lot cheaper. So when you're thinking about your use cases, you need to pick a model that balances your need for speed with the complexity at the task at hand. I wanna show you two models to emphasize just how different models are in comparison to speed, right? So I'm gonna show you two models from Anthropic, but I could do this comparison with models from Google, from Meta, from OpenAI. I'm not picking on Anthropic, okay? So this comes from the Claude series of models. These are Frontier models, so they're fancy, they're new. On the left, we have our speed demon, Claw 3 Haiku. This is your typical fast model. It's cheap, and it gets right to the point. And on the right, we have our Brainiac model. This is Claw 3 Opus. This is the type of model that you read, like you hear press releases about this type of model. It can do a PhD, it passed the LSAT, it passed the bar. This, this model is an overachiever, right? So most people, when they think about picking large language models, they're like, I'm gonna go get Claw 3 Opus. I want the smartest model possible. I wanna uh, share with you, actually, when you're building applications, speed matters the most. Because let me ask you this, how many people want to wait 11, 
20 seconds for a response every single time. Most people don't want to do that. So when you are thinking about real-time use cases, use cases where people are having frequent interactions with a large language model, you should prioritize speed. If you have a high volume e-commerce store and people are just asking, what's the status of my order? What's the cancellation policy? Don't use a frontier model for that. Use a fast, cheap model like Claude 3 Haiku, okay? Now, Claude 3 Opus, those frontier models, those really smart models do have a purpose. So if you wanted to do something like B2B technical support, you're a SaaS company, you have enterprise customers and you wanna build an assistant that can actually help you troubleshoot, a model like Claude 3 Opus will be able to ingest the documentation, understand the nuance of the customer's question, and create a comprehensive answer and solution. So that's speed. Next up is memory. Now, large language models do have a memory, just like we have memories when we think about stuff, right? And we have conversations. In the context of a large language model, this is called the context window size. Has anyone ever heard of this one? Context window size? It's pretty important. If you used ChatGPT really, really early on, early 2023, you might have remembered if you talked to it too long, it would start forgetting stuff. What happened was you hit the context window. So your old chats fell out of context and your new chats took up space. Now, you need a large context window if you want to analyze really long documents, if you want to have a multi-turn chat bot that's going to have very long conversations, if you want to summarize all the customer's case uh, cases that have come in from support and then see if there are any recurring issues, you need a large context window, right? Next up, and this one's new. This one's like from this year. Anyone here of a model called GP3, uh, GPT-4 Omni? Any hands? Anyone's heard of that one? Okay. So this is uh, modality. So traditionally, models take in text. You write in a nice little message, right? And then the model processes it, processes it, and then it generates text, right, in response. But as of this year, increasingly models are able to handle different types of inputs with the same underlying uh, large language model. So multimodal models are actually able to handle images, video, audio, and then generate text. Some models can generate uh, images as well, but generally those aren't large language models. But large language models can actually take in different modalities of inputs and then process them. This is really useful. This can be a game changer. So I want to paint a picture for you all. Imagine you have a technical support scenario where a customer has a malfunctioning product. It's broken. They, ch they chat into the chat bot and they say, hey, my product's broken. The chatbot says, hey, can you take a picture? They send a picture to the chatbot. The chatbot's able to take the context of the issues that the customer described, as well as the image of the actual product, and then come up with troubleshooting steps, or escalate, or even kick off a return process based on what it's both uh, heard from the chatter as well as seen in the picture. So multimodal models can be an absolute game changer. That being said, these three factors just help you understand, okay, what can I use this model for? Is it a fast, smart model, or is it a slow, super smart model? It doesn't really help you compare against individual models because you have a lot of different choices. You can pick a fast model from Anthropic. You could pick a fast model from Meta's Llama series. You could pick a fast model from OpenAI. How do you make the choice between models once you understand what type of model you need? For that, you need a benchmark. Now, a benchmark is just a standardized set of tasks that allow you to make an apples to apples comparison between similar products. If you've ever like purchased a car, for example, specifically like an electric car. Anyone have like range anxiety? I have so much range anxiety. I like range anxiety being like you, you worry that like you will run out of battery when you're on a long trip. So one thing that you'll see with EV companies uh, or car review companies is they'll do a benchmark to assess like how far can this car go versus that car. You can do the same thing with large language models. And in fact, a lot of like independent companies and organizations have done so. 
they make benchmarks. And those benchmarks usually assess models on a variety of kind of like arcane tasks. But I want to introduce you to the Salesforce benchmark because this one's a little different. This is a benchmark that's purpose built for CRM. So it actually is based on real use cases that Salesforce and its customers have worked together to come up with to understand, hey, what are the types of things large language models can solve? What are the types of things that people would want to actually deploy these models for and use and actually assess them on, right? It's designed with human insight. So we're not wondering whether or not the model can you know, tell how many R's are in the word strawberry, which is apparently a thing that models sometimes struggle with. And because you're able to have this type of evaluation of models, you can make data-driven decisions when picking a model specifically for CRM use cases. And this is true within the context of Salesforce, if you're using a tool like Salesforce's Prompt Builder, or its Models API, which is currently in beta, or if you're building outside of Salesforce. This is still true. So this benchmark is based on uh, four pillars. Accuracy, cost, speed, trust, and safety. Now, I'll be real with you. There are a lot of benchmarks that will give you speed and cost. But what really separates this benchmark is accuracy and trust and safety. And these two benchmarks in particular have four sub-pillars. So accuracy is not just like accuracy. It's factuality. Is it true? It's conciseness. Does the model get to the point? It's completeness. Does it actually answer the complete question? It's instruction following. Did it do what we actually want it to do? And these are things that we can judge to create a holistic view of like how accurate is this output. And we've done the same thing for trust and safety. Now, you might be wondering, how can you even do this? Well, this is the approach that our, our AI research team took. Again, they worked internally and with customers to come up with CRM use cases. And they built 150 prompts for each use case. They fed them into 15 plus, I think over 20 plus models at this point because we're constantly adding models to the benchmark. We got sample responses from the large language models, and we took a manual evaluation approach where we had humans judge uh, the actual sample responses on the score from uh, one to four, as well as automatic evaluation where we had a model do evaluation for us so that we could do it at scale. And based on that data, we've created a dashboard that you can use that's freely available so that you can make data-driven decisions when you're thinking about picking a large language model for CRM use cases. So now I want to get to a demo because I've talked a lot and I'd like to show you how this works. So this is, of course it wants to reload as soon as I get to it. Okay, so this is the LLM benchmark for CRM. You can get this, you can get to this through Google. You just type in Salesforce, LM benchmark for CRM. It's the very first thing you see. This is powered by Tableau. And it allows you to make, again, data-driven decisions across accuracy, cost, speed, and trust and safety. So let's go with a quick scenario. Let's say you're a financial services company and you want to build a chat bot. Okay? So for your customers so they can ask questions that they might have about loans or their account or what have you. Now, thinking through some of the considerations we talked about earlier, this is a real-time use case. We're expecting frequent interactions, right? So we're going to, of course, be thinking about cost and speed. Now, one thing that makes this dashboard very useful is not only do we have cost and speed here, like for all use cases, we can actually filter down to specific use cases. So I can go to use case and unselect all and just look for service. So maybe I want to do service live chat insights. Now, this allows me to see all of the relevant scores for my particular use case. So I'm doing an apples to apples comparison of these models on the use case that I'm actually trying to solve for. So again, 
we have all of our models here, and we can see, let's say we want to look for a low-cost model. So, one, so any model with just you know, one circle filled in is going to be uh, very, very cheap. And we can see here, let's say we see Claude 3 Haiku. It's a really good model. We see it does really well on costs. It does exceptionally well on speed. It does pretty well on trust and safety, but it's not as good as we would want it. Financial services is a pretty, um, trust and safety matters a lot in that particular field, right? It's a heavily regulated field. So maybe we look at Llama 3 8B. This is also a, a cheaper model. It's fast. It has really high trust and safety scores. But we notice on the left-hand side that accuracy is less than we want it to be. Now, again, accuracy is made up of four different pillars. So we can scroll down here, and we can see our accuracy breakdown to see if we can live with that score, if the key driver is something that doesn't bother us too much. So if we go to look for our model once more, see, where is Llama 3? All right, here it is, Llama 3 8B. So we see Llama 3 8B. It does really well on instruction following. It does well on completeness. It does well on factuality. Actually, what we can see here is that where it struggles is with conciseness. Now, here we have a decision point. We can decide, hey, we can live with that. We can tell our engineering team, this model talks a lot. If you build a, if you build a prompt, just make sure to tell it to be very concise. And you can do prompt engineering around it. Or we can decide that we can't live with that, and we can search for a different model. Either way, we are making data-driven decisions to inform which model we pick. And we know that we're picking, at the very least, a model that's fast, that's accurate, that has high trust and safety scores, right? So this is one way that you can approach making data-driven decisions when you're selecting an LLM. And again, you can use this outside of Salesforce, and you can use it within Salesforce especially if you're using a prompt builder or the models API, where you have multiple different uh, AI vendors that you can use. So lastly, I want to leave you with four steps for selecting the ideal model, and you just need four. Step one, think about the frequency and complexity of the task. Are you just handling routine questions with a chatbot, or do you need to do long-form content generation? Do you need to process highly technical documentation. Based on that, decide whether you need a fast model or an intelligent model. Consider the context window size. Are you going to try to process all of a customer's cases to understand what their recurring issues are? Or are you just going to do one-off uh, prompts? And then finally, think about additional modalities. Are you only going to work with text? Or could an image be an absolute game changer and en enable the large language model to have better insights and answers? And then finally, once you have an idea of what type of model you want to use, use the CRM benchmark to make some data-driven decisions. Okay? So I want to first give you this quick QR code if you want to hop on over to see the uh, LLM benchmark. We also have a nice short link here so you can go directly to it. Highly recommend you check it out. It's also, in addition to uh, a tool for being able to uh, assess models, it's a great way to discover models. So I want to thank you all for your time and attention. Hopefully, this has left you feeling much more ready and able to navigate the ever-changing LLM landscape. Thanks again. Uh, enjoy the rest of your Dreamforce. <laughs>